when when did you go into the the Navy and why? I I graduated high, I graduated high school in 1968 and uh, went to went to went to college at Fayetteville at University of Arkansas. Uh -huh. Completed one semester and really was not doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, my grades were not up to par. I was wasting my dad's money. So obviously, in, in 1968, if you had two arms and two legs and a heartbeat, the government came looking for you. So. Uh, a couple of buddies and I uh, decided that we better do something, and uh, uh, we wound up join, joining the Navy. Actually, we set out to join the Air Force, and it, could, it didn't, it wasn't going to work out for one of the guys. So we wound up going into the Navy. Oh, now did you do that because? Um, I mean, you did you do that just because you were interested in the Navy, or because there was something else you didn't want to do, and so you decided to move on the Navy first? <laughs> Going into the Army at that time didn't seem like a wise decision. Or I thought about the Marine Corps, but then once again, you're going to wind up, good chance of wind up in the jungle in Vietnam. So uh, uh, the Navy just became the next logical, next logical yeah. choice. No, so you were at a university there in, uh, in Arkansas, 68, 68, so I'm guessing... Well, you graduate in 68, uh, so the Tet Offensive is, is behind us, and, and I mean, this is, this is kind of the, the toughest part of the war. Just after Tet. Yeah. yeah. So this is the toughest part of the war. Um, what, was, um, what, was, um, what were things like at the University of Arkansas? Of course, we hear about the student you know, protests in California and, and, and the didn't East Coast and the Upper Midwest. And yeah. You know, they, you know, they didn't. I see guys telling stories about coming home from Vietnam and all the protesters getting spit on. I never saw any of that. Sure. There was no protesting that I can remember going on in Fayetteville at that time. I don't think there was really anything in Arkansas. There might have been a small group or something here that we didn't. This part of the country, we didn't really see that. You know, that was more of a coast, East Coast, West Coast, and yeah, I didn't see that. Yeah. So, I, I, I had no experience with protesters and spit on. And my three trips back from Vietnam we were all coming into Navy facilities. I never came into an airport, just a public oh. airport. So there were obviously no civilians other than family members greeting their loved yeah. ones. So yeah. There were no, there were no protests. I never saw any of that. Yeah. I mean, what did, um, what did the war mean to you at the time let me let me set the question up this way you know when i went into the navy actually you and i both served on the ranger you were there 20 years before i was but mm -hmm. um just to set this up i was peacetime uh when i went into the navy i was so clueless it didn't even dawn on me until halfway through boot camp that if there was a war i might be involved like for some reason i didn't connect the navy to like the military and war i don't really know what i was thinking i just kind of clueless and went to boot camp how about you? I mean, you know, I didn't really think about it either. It, uh, even growing up, you know, in, in the late sixties and seeing Vietnam on TV, on the news every night, it never really occurred to me that I might actually go there. Uh, it, we joined the Navy. We, like we had to go into some service. So we joined the Navy. Really? I think it was more just out of a sense of adventure than it was anything else because we had to serve somewhere. And, uh, and I saw a picture uh, before I went in of an aircraft carrier sailing through heavy seas. And I said, man, that's got to be neat. So, uh, so I went, uh, we went in the service, went in the Navy, and I volunteered for aviation duty. I thought, man, that's got to be a neat deal. Yeah. Uh, but I never, it never occurred to me that I was joining out of patriotic duty to go fight the war in Vietnam. I never, that never occurred to me that I might actually go there. So you go to, uh, you go to boot camp, you go to training, and then, and then from A school, we called at the time. After, after A school, got orders to VC3 Debt Bravo, NAS North Island, flew uh, San Diego, flew, flew out there, checked in with my squadron in, uh, at North Island, VC3. VC3 was a utility squadron. Their primary mission was providing drones for as target drones for Navy fighter pilots. They would practice their dog 
fighting and things with these with these jet drones that we were that we worked on and launched for the pilots. Well, let's, well, let's, let's, think, let's, stop, and, let's stop and talk about this for a second because I've never heard up until you know talking with you a, a few weeks ago. I hadn't heard of anything like drones being used in in Vietnam before. So tell us a little bit about that. Actually, actually, the Air Force was using them also. Well, like I said, they, the uh, VC-3 had several detachments. One they had a detachment. Most of them were out in the desert. That's where they launched them, and, and the pilots could chase them. But they had a, a detachment at Yuma, detachment at, I think, San Clemente, and then mm-hmm. maybe China Lake. But they also had a detachment that was aboard the USS Ranger. Uh, and that's, they said, dead Bravo. They said, well, you're, you're going to dead Bravo. I said, well, where's dead Bravo? They said, they're on the Ranger. They, they're on their way from San Francisco. They hadn't arrived yet, but they're on their way to Vietnam. So you flew on to the, you flew, flew on to, onto the yeah, ship then. I flew from, I flew from San Diego to Travis Air Force Base outside of San Francisco and then caught a charter with a bunch of other all services. Uh, a civilian charter to Clark Air Force Base in, in the, the Philippines. Philippines. Yeah. And then took an Air Force jet, C-141, into Da Nang, checked in with uh, the Navy C-1 outfit, which I actually was going to wind up working in that same <laughs> yeah. months later. Uh, waited for about three days because the Ranger hadn't arrived on station yet. Uh, I was there in Da Nang for about three days, and then we flew out to the ship. So the first time I ever set foot on the aircraft carrier, I landed on it. Yeah, wow. Uh, yeah, that must be something. I never got to experience that, but that, that must have been something else. You go, you go from We went from 90 knots to zero knots uh, in three seconds. So you actually set foot in... In Da Nang, Vietnam, before heading to the Ranger off the off the coast. October October of '69 is when I, I was first was the time I was boots on the ground at Da Nang. Uh, Ranger hadn't arrived on station yet. Yeah. So I had there's a, a transit barracks right there at the at the Fleet Air Support Unit, and so I had to check into the transit barracks, wait for the Ranger to get close enough so the C1s could take us out. And uh, so I'm, I'm checked into this transit barracks and night comes and I'm laying there in my rack and I hear all, you know, I'm hearing, seeing strange lights on the horizon and hear boom. Mm. And no one told us anything. We didn't know what in the heck was going on. Turned out it was outgoing, outgoing artillery. We didn't know what it was for, you know, for all we knew we were under attack. Yeah. That was, that was my first introduction. Wow. It, to Vietnam was outgoing artillery and me thinking it was incoming or not knowing what it was. Yeah, that's a question I, I often ask vets, um, you know, because when you're heading to Vietnam, you know that you're heading to a war zone, but it's kind of an abstraction until you're there. And then I'll ask veterans at what point, you know, did it become real to you that, oh yeah, okay, this really is a war zone. Was that, was that, that moment for you? That night when, uh, when I'm, we're all there's other people there. We're looking around, saying, "What are we supposed to do? Uh-huh. Are we under attack?" Yeah. Um, what is your What is your very first memory of? Oh, no, that's outgoing. Don't worry about. It. Yeah. What is your very first memory of of Vietnam itself? Of course, you're setting foot, you know, on a on a U.S. base. But what What's your very first memory of just being in the country? Well, the. The, when when you step off the plane, the first thing you notice is how hot it is, hot and humid it is. Now October, you know, it's later in the year, so it wasn't as horrible as yeah as summertime. But uh, it's hot and humid. Strange smells in the air. The yeah. Plane, the, 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 yeah. The 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 land, the runway at Denang is not that far from the from the from the town. There's just a little fence, just a little ways over. So there's a lot of the, the smells of Da Nang coming waffling into the into the area so you notice the heat and the humidity which I grew up in Arkansas we have plenty of heat and humidity so it didn't affect me that much but a lot of the guys that did yeah uh but smells the unusual smells yeah that's that's those are the classic things that they, compared to what we did yeah 
Yeah, yeah, those are the classic responses, the heat, the heat, the humidity and the smells. Yeah. Okay, so then you get on a plane and, and fly out fly out to the Ranger. Fly to the Ranger. We got to the Ranger at the time she was recovering aircraft, or rec recovering a combat strike when we just as we got to the so the the combat strike, the, the F fours and the A sevens and the uh, A6s, they have, they've got priority landing because they've been on a combat strike in North Vietnam, so they're probably low on fuel. So mm -hmm. we had to circle the plane waiting for them. So I'm sitting there watch, looking out the window watching all the planes land and looking down at the ship, this little tiny ship. Wow. Like thinking, how are we going to land on that? Mm, yeah. And so we, we did that for a while, and then it came our turn, and we got in the flight path and and landed, and like I said, you go from 90 knots to zero knots in about three seconds. When you hit that deck, yeah. It's, anything that's not tied down is, is flying. Yeah. About about how far off the coast was the, you know, did the Ranger operate? They, they typically operated at, uh, and I don't know exactly because they didn't tell us, but yeah. from what I've read, we were typically operating at about 100 miles off the coast. Okay, so you 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 can't you can't see what's going on. In I country. never saw land the whole time. In two different Westpacs in the Yankee Station, I never saw land. Wow. Yeah. Describe a describe a, a typical day. Well, let me and let me you know part of this too. As you said a few minutes ago, you know you thought it would be an adventure to be on a ship out in the high seas and all that, and and it is for about two days, and then and then you realize you got six months to go. After standing, um, after about three days, three or four days of standing in the chow hall line for an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so, so to describe a describe a, a typical day. You're you're in the South China Sea. You know, well, you can't see land, but you've got all the flight operations going. What what are you doing? Well, we we worked when a when a carrier when a carrier went on the, the gun line or Yankee Station. It would go on for typically thirty days. 30 days, and then, would, then it would go in port for a week. Might go to Subic, might go to Sasebo, Japan, might go to mm -hmm. Hong Kong. We'd go out for 30 days, and if th at 30 days, you work uh, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, 30 days straight. There was no days off. 12 on, 12 off, 12 on, 12 off, 12 on, 12 off. Yeah. yeah. For 30 days, then you go in port for a week, and then you go in, in port for a week, you're on three-section duty, so you, every third day, you're having to stay aboard ship. But uh, uh, what we did, we were taking these these uh, target. We were uh, taking target drones. This was I, this was a. I was in a secret experimental project called Project Spra. S P R A. S P R A. Okay. Yes. Project Special purpose reconnaissance aircraft. We were taking target drones, and when I say drones, I'm not talking about the little drones that you see today with the four propellers or whatever, you know, that are two or two foot wide. These were jet drones that were about 20 foot long. They're like a miniature plane, jet plane. We had, a, we were launching, we're, the Navy was losing so many, so many airplanes over, over Hanoi and Haiphong Harbor, the reconnaissance planes, which at that time they used A-5 vigilantes may, as mainly as reconnaissance. Yeah. They were shot down. So this was an experimental program. They were taking these target drones, or a version of them, mounting a camera to them when we would launch them from the flight deck. We had a special launching uh, apparatus that we launched them from the flight deck. They were on a computerized program. They'd know to fly whatever route that they were going to fly. A certain time they would turn the camera on. They would fly their route, come back close to the ship. Uh, we'd hit a button and pull the drag chute out of the drone. It would start slowing down. Then a shoot with another button would make a shoot pop out of the top, and at the top of the shoot that, that came out of the top of the drone, there was a there was a hook. Our helicopters from the ship SH3s would hover over that and catch it. Wow! It would take that drone, bring it over to the flight deck, and set it down in the cart. Pretty neat deal. It was a secret project. Do you know how? I mean, so obviously you're allowed to talk about it now. Yeah. At the time, did you have a top, or a, a, you must have had a security clearance? Secret. To clearance. Secret? Secret. 
And and do you know, I mean, how long ago was it, did it become okay to, to talk about the, this project? I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. But interesting yeah. story, we were in in Hong Kong with, uh, and we were at a, at a, uh, a bar in Hong Kong and one of the bar hostesses ladies came up to, we have patches on our on our like all you know the little patches designating on your on your dress blues what or your twice what what you what squad what you were attached to what squad yeah at our squadron and this 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 Chinese lady came up to me and said aren't you the one aren't you the people that send the airplanes up that take pictures. And I'm thinking, whoa, wow. what is this? <laughs> anyway, I said, no, that was, that's not me. <laughs> I don't know who that is. <laughs> so this lady working in a, it was in a bar in Hong Kong. She knew. Yeah, it was, it was a strange, uh, wow. A strange deal. Now, did all of these drones make it back or were some shot down? No, we lost, there were had 10, we lost all of them. Uh, several were shot down, several just disappeared. One of them we lost control of, and it flew over Red China. In fact, there was a, you can still find it on, online of an international incident. This, this would have been probably in 70. China, Red China, as we called it back then, China shoots down American spy plane. And what it was is one of our drones. We lost contact with it, and it, and it, uh, left Vietnam and went into China and crashed. I mean, we think it just ran out of fuel and crashed, but they said they shot it down. There was pictures. There was a picture wow. online at one time of that, that drone that caused the international incident. I was the last person to touch that drone because I, I would go in and touch the telemetry t antenna right at the very end. Yeah. So it was broken when all the move, maneuvering. Uh, so I was the last one to touch it before it crashed in red China. So. Um, so you lost, so you lost, or the Ranger lost all 10 of those drones. Some yeah, we lost them. down, one down in China, one, yeah, one, what happened to it? We launched them with, a, when we launched the drones off, uh, of course they had a jet engine. The jet engine was turning and then we'd use a JADO, if you know what a JADO bottle is, which is a, 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 a powerful rocket assist attached to it. They would launch the Jado bottle, you know, the engines turn in full speed. Jado bottle would, would set it off, it would carry it and get it up to speed. And then the Jado bottle, which is on a rack on the bottom of the drum, would fall off. We had one that we launched, we got it, it wasn't probably 50 yards off the flight deck, and the Jado bottle blew up. Oh, wow. Okay, so that one's gone. And then we lost, well, once again, the, we had the one that crashed in Red China. We had several that were shot down in over uh, North Vietnam. So the Ranger would do operations out there off the coast of Vietnam for, you said a month, and then you'd go into port? Go into port. And how long would you be in port, roughly? We typically about a week. And then three. back to the South China Sea again? Yeah, they go straight back to Yankee Station. 30 days, go to Hong Kong. 30 days, maybe go to Sasebo, Japan. I'm, I'm imagining on a carrier, you went to Subic at least once or anyway. twice. I've been in the Civic a lot. Yeah. There's QB Point. Yeah. So it's, it's the Naval Air Station at right. Civic. Now, so did you ever cross the famous bridge into Alonopo? The uh, Yes, I, I was a young red-blooded American sailor. I ventured yeah. out into the, the uh, hinterlands of uh, the exotic Alonopo city. Well, let me let me ask you about this because I crossed you know, the famous river that we called. Uh, I won't say it starts with an S and ended with an H I T river. Yeah. Yes, we, we, yeah, the the, the famous river. Yeah. Uh, so I want to ask you about that, but um, I I went to the Philippines. I went to Vietnam and the Philippines, but it started but, out. Yeah. I, I was in the Phil. I, I went back to the Philippines a few years ago, and. Uh, and my primary reason for going was that I just wanted to go back to that bridge. Because a as, a, as a kid who grew up in Southern California, I mean, I, I grew up in a pretty rough area. Um, but as a 19-year-old American kid crossing that bridge for the first time and going into Alangapo, 
that that was a that was for me that was a life changing event. I mean, a, in that, like you know, you've just entered a, a world that you just can't conceptualize <laughs> back in the states. Uh, is, does that's that resonate? That's a long ways from Sherwood, Arkansas. <laughs> So, I mean, what, what are some words? I mean, it's a family show, but I mean, what are, what are some words that you would use to describe Alonapo in, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s? Of course, that was the playground of the Seventh Fleet, as they called it back then. You know, except for a 19-year-old kid from Sherwood, Arkansas, it was quite a, uh, quite a culture shock to uh, go into this place. Of course, I know it's changed a lot now. I've looked at it online. It looks paved, paved streets. And, but back then, it was dirt. It's all dirt streets. And Oh, really? Uh, it's, the only the way, Here's the way I would describe it to people. I said, you, mean, you know what it's like when you go to the state fair and all these people are going down through the, the fair and all these lights are flashing and these sounds and all these crazy smells from all yeah, the fr- yeah. I said, it's like that, but instead of hawkers saying, you know, come play this game, it's hookers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It and every, and every bar had a, had a had some guy with a shotgun or a it loaded. I mean, it was, it's a crazy place. You have to be very careful. With, you know, people would try to steal from you. I had my pocket big. Of course, on the old tropical whites, you know, there's not many places to put anything. So we put money in our shirt pocket, and, uh, and I, wow. one time the, the kids would 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 swarm you and try to distract you. And while one's distracting you over here, the other one's taking your watch off or getting into your pocket. And it happened to me. I lost, I think, twenty dollars. Oh, is that right? So yeah, it was, think, it's an unusual place. Yeah, and you know, I don't know of another place. I mean. You know, where you, you've got the order and the tranquility of a U.S. Navy base where everybody's following the rules and the traffic is orderly and, you, you know, you cross a bridge that's maybe 50 yards long and now you're just in this world of, of chaos yeah. and mayhem. Guys yelling out on loudspeakers, change your money here, change your money here. We give it's, four to one or whatever, you know. Change. Changes. Changing your money from greenbacks to pesos. Yeah, wow. It, it's a wild. It's a wild place. You'll yeah. never forget it. So after the Ranger, you you. My understanding, is, if I remember correctly, is that you volunteered. You wanted to go back to Vietnam proper, and so if do I have that right? You volunteered to go back to Da Nang. I got this crazy idea that I I wanted to see the war a little closer. I didn't want to get shot or killed or anything, but I thought I'd get a little. I'd like to get a little closer to it. So I volunteered to go in country. Well, the ranger came back to to uh, San Francisco, Alameda, and we flew back down to North Island. And then a couple, it wasn't just a few weeks later, uh, I got a notification that I had a chance to go back. Uh, and that's when, because the uh, Navy C-2s that were taking people out to the aircraft carriers were were having mechanical problems and they were starting to fall out of the sky. So they had to start shifting over to C1s, carrier onboard delivery systems out of Da Nang again. And uh, so because they're closer to the ships and they needed a, they needed a crew, a squadron, a detachment to go over there and work on those. So about 60 or 70 of us flew over in a Navy transport. It took us three days, three days. And what did you do? Like the Philippines, Japan? <laughs> Had engine trouble, stopped at Barber's Point Naval Air Station in Hawaii while they repaired the airplane. Lord, then we went to uh, uh, Wake Island and refueled wow. eight, and then went to Guam, and then went to Philippines, and then finally ended up in in Da Nang. Because it's an old Navy four-engine prop transport. It cruised at about two seventy-five. It's not like a five hundred mile you know mile an hour jet. Yeah, yeah. So we got to Da Nang, and uh, and we start started working on on C ones, CODs, carrier onboard delivery. We would haul uh, personnel transfers and mail out to the three or four carriers that are on Yankee Station. And oh, that's an important job getting the mail out there, huh? Yeah, it's very important. And you remember that hearing that bell, right? Mail call. Yeah, mail call. Yeah, so, yeah. At, at the time. Uh, Da Nang was called, nickname was Rocket City. 
there was a, if you look at a map of Denang, there's a strip. They called it the Rocket Belt. That's where in Marines patrol this. It surrounded the west side of Denang. Yeah, which where the VC would sneak in at night, and because that was the the, the the distance from the Rocket Belt to to the airstrip was just about the right distance for their rockets to come in. So they called that the Rocket Belt, and they would come in at night and shoot rockets at us. So you you experienced that you had the incoming. You'd have to hit the uh, you'd have to hit the bunkers, and and I worked at night. And uh, but yeah, they, the sirens would go off. And you'd have to hit the bunkers. I stood a uh, I stood a bunker watch. There was two because uh, mm. we weren't that far. Once again, as I said before, we weren't that far from the perimeter. And uh, occasionally, Charlie would use a a a rocket attack as a as a as a sub subterfuge, you know, for a, 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 a people sneaking in through the wire with a diversion. Yeah. Yeah. Diversion is the word I was looking yeah, at. Yeah. Yeah. And so what we were afraid of is they come in through the wire, they run, here's our bunkers. They run past the bunkers to get to the aircraft to blow the aircraft up. Well, it's real easy to throw a satchel charge into a bunker full of people. So I stood a bunker watch with that one guy with M16. I had a, what they called a riot gun, which was a shotgun, but they mm-hmm. couldn't call it a shotgun. Oh. It's some kind of Geneva convention. <laughs> oh, so they, they called it the riot gun. Okay. So just in case someone did get, it was a diversion and, and someone got through the, wow. so, uh, so that was interesting that we were there for a few months. Did, did, did you, did you, I mean, you, you experienced the rockets coming in. Did you also have experience with sappers trying to no get as well? while we were there and when I never, when I was there, they never really got a rocket that close. Now the, the rockets hit our, our compound before I got there, not long before and hit it after. But the time I was there, we never had one hit our compound. They would hit, we had one hit close to the hangar. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any interactions when you're on the base, any interactions with, with Vietnamese, with, you know, the hooch uh, maids and things like that? The folks? We had, uh, we had hooch maids. That in the barracks for us, Mama San and her daughter, can't remember her name. Yeah. Care that that was about it. That was about our only interact because we couldn't leave the compound. We could <clears throat> under like an escort to go to the uh, exchange, Freedom Hill in Denang or Camp Tinchal, you know, to the exchange, but we couldn't go into town. So oh really? Then, you you uh, it was off Denang was off limits at that time. It was too dangerous to go into town. Wow. Couldn't go into town and uh we would, we about once a month we'd go to the PX. It was an interest it was interesting few months there at Denang. Uh we, we'd have to do th- like I said, I worked at night, we'd have to do things like if something was going on close to the perimeter, C one thirty through helicopters would fly would drop flares to light that area up. We'd have to get out. These flares, these these flares would drift mm-hmm. towards the runway. We'd have to get out on top of our airplanes with wet mops in case a flare. Oh, <laughs> take it down! And yeah. one of our airplanes caught it on fire. We'd have to yeah. knock it off. The, we'd have to wow. knock it off the airplane. We had a small EM club there at at, uh, at our little compound in Denang. The enlisted men's club. Yeah. Uh, and I went in there one night and I was having a drink and the guy came up and sat down beside me, started talking. And, uh, he said, Oh, by the way, he said, is there a sick bay here at the company? I said, yeah. I said, I, I said, is something wrong with you? He said, well, this guy was a Navy SEAL. It just uh-huh. happened to stop him to do the, he said, he said, yeah, I've got a promise. I got shot today. <laughs> And I said, uh, you got shot today? He said, yeah, and I need to have it looked at. And I said, I said what do you mean you got shot today? And he opened up his camouflage. The whole side of his, of his, his whole side here was, was gashed out. And he had like a, you know, a, a combat bandage on it and blood was oozing. And I said, uh, I said, well, why are you sitting here having a drink if you need it? 
to go to the sick bay. Anyway, so I, I said, here, let me take you over there. I took him to the sick bay, and I guess they sewed him up. I don't know. I never saw him after that. But that was an unusual thing that happened. Uh, I got to go to Saigon. spent the night in Saigon, which was it's, that's kind of like our favorite city in the Philippines, but not quite as bad, not quite as active. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, so you, you did go to Saigon then? You spent a night in Saigon. We used to draw straws at each shop. Whoever you know got the right, the short straw would, would get to take the trip. So we had nothing to do anyway. So we flew down to to Saigon just on a Liberty run and uh, spent a couple of days in Saigon. Funny, I've got an interesting story there. We were, in order to move around in Vietnam, you had to have orders saying that you were allowed to. And we didn't, have, we, we got into Saigon, when we got to Saigon, or Tonsonut Air Force Base, a Navy uh, vehicle took us off base and into town and dropped us off. We spent a couple of days. Well, it came time for us to fly back to Da Nang. So I, uh, we got a cab, there's I think three of us, and took us and dropped us off at the front of the, the front gate to get on, on the Tonsonut so we could catch our plane. We went to go in, we showed our IDs, they said, where's your orders? These are Air Force police, and they're sitting there, they got this 50 caliber machine gun, uh, mm. in case there's some kind of VC trying to get in. Oh, yeah. And, uh, he said, where are your orders? I said, uh, what are you talking about? We don't. He said, you have to have orders to move around, particularly side guys. Said, There's a lot of AWOL Army guys here. They have gone AWOL out of the jungle. They don't want to go back out in the jungle. So they're AWOL. Because you know, he's pretty easy to hide in side guy. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so they said, I said, well, we don't have those kind of orders. So they took us. Uh, so we came down from Da Nang. We don't know about any orders. So they said, well, you're going to have to go with us. And they took us to the Air Force brig oh. and had guns on us. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> called the Navy. I said, why don't you call the Navy? They'll, they'll take care of it. They called the Navy. Shore, Shore Patrol showed up. They uh, said, we'll take care. We told the Air Force guys, we'll take care of these guys. They got us, put us in their Jeep, took us to our airplane, said, Said if you come back to Saigon, don't mess with Air Force police. Said they don't like sailors. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of that. Yeah. And we wow. flew we flew back to Da Nang. Yeah. So I didn't know that. You've got army guys just, just running around Saigon they, on their AWOL. They didn't want to go out in the boonies. AWOL in Saigon. Wow. They didn't, they didn't want to go back out in the jungle. Yeah. Now you so you you serve on the Ranger, you spend this time in Da Nang, and then you also serve on the carrier Ticonderoga, once again in the South China Sea. Once again, I had volunteered to stay uh, in Vietnam, so I got orders to a Navy helicopter squadron. It was flying support uh, for the riverboats in the Mekong Delta, flying out of Tonson taking supplies and, and personnel. And, yeah. But I had to go back to the States. I had not went back to the States to go to survive. I went to... Uh, the SEAL base at Coronado to go through uh, survival school in case I was flying, I'm going to be flying crew. So went yeah. back, went through uh, uh, a week of classroom instruction about jungle survival and then uh, went through a couple of days of small weapons training at Camp Pendleton Marine. You know, we learned how to shoot the M16 and M16, right. M79. And uh, we're, we were waiting to go to the, the, the survival part of the training, the escape and evasion and prisoner of war, this fake prisoner of war camp they put you in and try to. Right, yeah. And I, we were sitting around waiting to go there, and uh, I got called to personnel. I said, your orders have been changed. You're not going back to Vietnam. You're, they're having a troop reduction, so they've been changed. So they sent me right up the road to back to north island back to north island well, or not there to a navy uh, carrier base and uh, air anti-submarine squadron working on uh s2s which is an aircraft that was the same airframe as the c1 but it was full of electronic equipment rather than cargo yeah what uh, what was the what's the role of the s2 when you when you get off get off the coast in the south china sea what was the job of the S2? There were two operators. Yeah, of course, you had a pilot and a co-pilot. Uh, and there were two op operators. There were AWs. 
uh, anti-submarine warfare operators that sat in the back. They operate all the electronic equipment that, that, that the airplanes would track uh, submarines, track, track Russian subs. Russian subs. So, uh, as an AT, I would, we worked on that equipment. Yeah. Uh, and, when it go bad. And I've never heard this before, but I'm assuming the Soviets did have their own subs in the, in the South China Sea. Oh, yeah. That's why we went. At that time, this was, yeah. I think, April of 72, that the Easter Offensive, that's when, you know, we'd pulled a lot of troops out of, out of Vietnam by that time. So, right. And the South Vietnamese were taking over. Well, the, so the North Vietnamese decided, well, it's time for us to get down. I, mean, I think we can beat these guys. So they started coming down uh, from the north and flooding all of I, what we call I Corps, the northern, northern part of right. Vietnam. Yeah. And so that's when Nixon decided to bomb Haiphong Harbor. I mean, I'm sorry, mine Haiphong Harbor. So we had ships in there doing all that kind of stuff. Well, there were a lot of Russian subs kind of hanging around. Before we went on Westpac, we pull out of San Diego and do a little training. Uh, maybe carry what we call carrier qualls. That's where pilots have to qualify right. with their carrier landing. Yeah. San Diego at night. Uh, and uh, we were recovering aircraft. By that time, I was a, I was a, a plane captain for, an, for the S-2. Okay. Uh, I just checked into the squadron. So I, when, before you go to a shop, they'll let you work on the uh, on the flight line for a while to get familiar with the aircraft and, and do those duties. And then the certain people were selected as plane captains. You're in charge of the airplane. Make sure it, it, each airplane is, is is maintained properly, fueled, oil, everything. So I was a yeah. plane captain. We're recovering aircraft at night. Which a flight deck at night is a pretty hazardous place because you can't see. There's no white light. Everything's red light. So yeah. no pilots, and uh, we just recovered another squadron had just recovered a plane. I was in that same area, and it's right next to me. And the and the, the plane captain for that that airplane he had tied when a plane when a, when a when an aircraft would land a propeller aircraft before they would shut down their engines we had to chain the plane down so they chained down he had chained down one side of the airplane and was walking around he's walking a few feet from me he came around the other side and he just didn't know he wasn't you got to be very careful he walked into the prop oh no uh, uh, that was that was probably the, the worst thing that happened as far as what i saw other than seeing a lot of bodies in, in Da Nang, because we weren't very far from the mortuary uh, that where they would bring the bodies in from the field. That was pretty bad, seeing this guy walk into the prop. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you saw that. Yeah. Didn't actually see it. I saw it a few seconds afterward when his body fell over. So, uh, so I'm assuming it was, I mean, so he was, he was killed instantly. I would have thought, I don't know what happened to him after that. They hauled him off. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. We lost a few over there. We lost 12 on the Ranger. From accidents and we lost 12 people on the Ranger. We lost, uh, one guy fell overboard and drowned. One guy got killed on the flight deck and we lost four pilots and one enlisted crew got killed and then five pilots were missing. So, so we had a total of 12 on the range. Shot down. Shot down. I don't know what happened to the missing, if they made it or, or not. So we lost, so, we lost 12. Didn't lose any on the Ticonderoga on the West Bay, but we lost 12 on the range. What, what impact did that have on the flight on the, the, you know, you're up there working on the deck. Um, when one way or another you find out that one of the planes has been shut down and isn't coming back? I, uh, you didn't really, unless you were in that squadron and you would, unless you were in that squadron, you wouldn't even really know about it unless you just heard, overheard somebody talking. I mean, we knew that guys were getting shot down. So yeah, you know, that's demoralizing, but uh, and, you, and you feel bad. But 
most of the time you really weren't that aware of it unless you were one of the personnel from that squadron that obviously yeah. they would know about it. But it, uh, And you, of course, I mean, you lose the drones, but that's oh, different. And, that's and then, it, yeah, and then the S, is it the S2s? Those are, those are over water, right? So they're not, did, did, you didn't lose any of those planes? And the S2s? Yeah. No, I never, never lost a C1 or an S2. Yeah. Uh, during that time. So you mentioned just a minute ago um, working near the the mortuary in, in Da Nang. Yeah, we weren't that um, far from the mortuary, and we'd have to go. Uh, there was a, and this, I know this is going to sound terrible, but there was a boot shortage of all things at that time. You couldn't get any boots. And so at the mortuary, when guys would come in from that were killed, they would take their boots unless they were met something wrong with them or covered with with blood or whatever. They would take their boots, tie them together, and throw them in a pile. And that's where you got your new boots was out of that pile. And so I can remember going over the, the mortuary and looking at those boots. I was going, and then I thought, no, I can't do this. I may do with what I had. And uh, they were they were bring. That's where there were there were two mortuaries in in Vietnam. One at Tonsonu at Saigon, and one at Da Nang Army mortuaries. Army took care of all that. And that's where they would bring the, the bodies in the field would go to staging areas and then they would group them together and then bring them into the mortuary. So they would come in from the field, uh, bodies uh, from the field, and they were all bloated and they were wrapped up, but they were all bloated like, uh, like an animal you'd see alongside the road. So that was, that was, uh, that was a bad experience. I used to see those all the time. Yeah. So you never heard that story like that about the boots? Well, I mean, you, you, you hear that kind of thing a lot. You know, you have a guy, maybe you have a, a KIA, you have a, a firefight and a guy is killed and, um, and the other guys in the squad need stuff. And so they, you know, they, they take what they need and it's, you know, it's, I guess it's a, that's one of the rough parts of war, right? You know, um, we were talking uh, um, a while back and, you know, and the question, you know, when did, you, you know you're going to a war zone, but then something happens and then you really realize, oh yeah, I'm in a war zone. And so you talked about being in Da Nang before you flew to the Ranger and that outgoing artillery and then, okay, yeah, I'm in a war zone. When you see this mortuary and you see what's going on there, does, does, that, does that become even more real? I mean, does that does does that make sense? And I still get I get this. There's a certain feeling I would get over there that that once again you don't really. I never really thought about the Vietnam that much until I got over there. And there's just bizarreness to the place. And I still, on occasion, will get that feeling. Something will trigger that. And there, there's just an eerie. There's just an eeriness about it. And you would because you suddenly realize. That, you know these people are trying to kill you, and uh, and and I still uh, I can't, uh, fun, I'll get that feeling, I'll have a certain smell or a certain I'll see a certain thing, and and you feel like you're back over there, and in all of its weirdness. So yeah, you think uh, you mentioned the the scorpion. I, I haven't heard of that before. Um, you said scorpion. Just, just just real quick, what's the story there? Scorpion was on in 1968, May of 1968, was on his way back from a uh, med cruise. It just completed a med cruise and was coming back to Norfolk and uh, disappeared, lost contact. They finally found it. It was 400 miles southwest of the Azores in 10,000 feet of water. And there's all kinds of, you can get, there's a lot of stuff about it online about different theories about they never have actually come up with a reason 100 percent sure of what happened to the scorpion wow but uh yeah uh, i've never heard of that and yeah 1968 my my wife's brother was a, a nuclear electronics 
a technician aboard the Scorpion when it went down. So we lost him wow. in 1968. We did a, I've, I've retired. I've, I've, uh, I had a, I've been in the flooring business about 37 years, but the last 20 something years I was doing stained concrete floors and I would engrave things in the concrete. And we did a memorial to the Scorpion down on the down in Little Rock, down on the river. There's where the where the USS Razorback is. Have you ever seen that? The submarine. Yeah. yeah. We did a memorial. We engraved and stained a, uh, a memorial to the Scorpion down there. If you're ever down there, you can take a look mm -hmm. at it. Well, and it was your brother-in-law who was on the Scorpion. Yes, my my wife's brother. What What, what was his name? Richard Schaefer. When you look back on Vietnam now, what's your what, what's your what's your sense of the conflict now? Looking back on it, that that really it was a waste of of people and, and money, and it because it wasn't it it wasn't we didn't fight it to win. There, there, it was, it was more political. I think the intent originally was, you know, the old uh, domino theory, we got to stop communism. That was the thinking back then. Yeah. Once they did that, because of fear of what Red China would do or what Russia would do if we did this, it wasn't fought. You know, you don't go into wars to, to just tread water. You go in that, you go, you, you go in to win. And, and we didn't do that. And a lot of, young people died because of that so yeah so and, so in in retrospect it was it's a tragedy and of course i guess all war is tragedy but uh, right yeah so you're you're referring to something that you hear a lot from vietnam veterans that of course we're fighting the war i mean you're talking about it we're flying drones we've got the s2s uh we, you know we're sending out artillery so obviously you know there's combat but a lot of vets say this, that there's a feeling like, you know, we can fight, but only to a certain point and never, yeah. and, and never really, not really to the point where we could actually win the thing. You know, we could get to the, the maybe real the 30 yard game. line, but they'd never let us get to the end zone. That, that I can of. imagine the frustration for the guys who were actually not like me that were just support troops, but the guys that were actually doing the fighting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can imagine their frustration. Uh, with rules of engagement, mm -hmm. I mean, it's war. You, you, you fight war to win. You don't. If, you, if you're afraid you're going to make the Chinese mad, I mean, then it's time to get out. Mm. So, given that, are you never the are you nevertheless glad that you served? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So why? Because some people would say, well, that's. Service. It's weird because on the one hand, Bob says this, but then he says he's, he's glad he served. How do you make sense of that? I don't know, uh, but I, I'm, I'm proud of my service. I'm glad I went to Vietnam. Yeah. I wished I could, like you said before, I wished I, my orders hadn't got changed and I could have gone to the other helico the helicopter squadron. But I'm proud of my service. I'm proud. I, you know, that's, you know, my, my country sent me over there and I, and I did the best I could. But uh, I'm, you know, I'm very proud of that. Yeah, yeah. I can't. There's not a whole lot I can do about the political decisions that are made about you know, what, right. what you do. You do but, your job. But I am proud I served. Yeah. When you you, you have your you have your hat on now. Um, when you're at a store and you see another guy with the Vietnam hat, will you usually? Say something, just sort of make a quick connection. I try to, yeah. Like the, the, the thing about with Vietnam veterans is, is if they'll see each, if they see each other, they say, uh, "Welcome home." Yeah. Because we we didn't we didn't get a parade. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. like the Middle East veterans that of the various wars in the Middle East, they have that welcomed home. We weren't, we weren't really well, you know, once, as we talked earlier, it wasn't as bad in Little Rock, Arkansas, as it was in San Francisco. Right. Yeah. There was never any, any problems or, you know, people, people were proud of the military people. Yeah. But, but yeah, I would, we'd, I, I try to acknowledge other people if I see them wearing the hat. Yeah. 
I think that I think that's the statement right there. The the, the guys that win are proud that they serve. 